No name in the world is more instantly recognizable in connection with travel than Thomas Cook. He made it possible for countless millions of tourists to visit stunning locations such as here in Snowdonia in North Wales by arranging excursions at affordable prices for all classes of people. He built a business empire worth billions, but nothing in his early life remotely suggested that he would one day become a household name across the globe. People say to me, you've been researching Christian giants of business. Isn't that a contradiction in terms? Surely the world of business and Christians inhabit different moral universes. This is not necessarily the case. There are people who've built huge empires on Christian principles. They're intrigued. We're here in the lovely village of Melbourne, Derbyshire, where Thomas was born on the 22nd of November, 1808. His birthplace, Nine Quick Close, no longer stands, but this memorial indicates the spot. His early years here were marked by considerable pain and hardship. His father, John Cook, was a labourer, but he died when Thomas was only four years old. His mother, Elizabeth, then married another labourer, James Smithard, and had two sons with him. James was a very supportive father to Thomas. He paid for him to go to school. But unfortunately, when Thomas was 10, the money became so tight in the family, he had to leave school, find work, and supplement the family income. He was employed here on Lord Melbourne's estate as a market gardener's assistant, working six days a week. The work in the market garden was physically demanding for 10-year-old Thomas. He had to fetch and carry heavy sacks and baskets and do a lot of digging. But to make matters worse, the man he assisted, John Roby, was so frequently drunk, he was incapable of selling the garden's produce in the neighboring villages. And so Thomas had to take on this extra burden himself. His life was already very hard, but two years later, it became even harder when his stepfather died. Now, in addition to his work on the estate, he had to help his mother look after his two younger brothers. Sadly, his struggle seemed never ending. Two years later, he started an apprenticeship as a wood turner and cabinet maker with his uncle, John Pegg. Would you believe it, Pegg, like Roby, was also an alcoholic. And once again, Thomas found himself burdened with an extra workload. Now, experiencing alcoholism at close quarters over long periods scarred Thomas. But these disturbing experiences were to prove blessings in disguise. Very importantly, it was during those years of struggle that the seeds of his deep Christian faith were sown. Through his faith, he found the strength to persevere. He became a member of the Baptist Chapel in Melbourne, and in the Sunday school, he showed such commitment that he was promoted first to teacher and then to superintendent. Thomas looked up to the chapel's minister, Joseph Winks, as a father. It must have saddened him, therefore, when Winks left Melbourne in 1826 to set up a printing press in Loughborough and publish Christian magazines for the young and the poor. However, 
when Pegg's drinking got too much for Thomas, he gave up his apprenticeship at the age of 18 and decided to join Winks in Loughborough to learn the art of printing and publishing. During his time in Loughborough, Thomas became increasingly aware of the call to preach the gospel, the good news of God's gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, his son. And so, age 19, he successfully applied to the General Baptist Missionary Society to become an evangelist. The work of an itinerant evangelist was demanding. As his income was meager, Thomas couldn't afford stagecoach travel and had to walk long distances. In one year alone, he covered more than 2,000 miles on foot. He also met with ridicule and contempt from hecklers who threw stones at him and physically attacked him. But he took all this in his stride. Thomas served as an evangelist for three years, but then the funds of the Baptist Missionary Society ran out. He urgently needed to find other employment. He therefore returned to his work as a woodturner, setting up in business in the village of Baradon in Rutland. He was drawn to Baradon because of his affection for Marianne Mason, a farmer's daughter who lived here. He'd met her two years previously at the Baptist Chapel while an evangelist. She was a teacher in the Sunday school. Marianne kept house for a widower father and looked after her five younger brothers. Thomas lodged with the family while he was working in Baradon. However, there proved to be too little work for a woodturner in the village. So in November 1832, Thomas moved to Market Harbour with its larger population. Just four months later, he felt he'd earned enough to provide for a wife and start a family, and so he proposed to Marianne. In March 1833, they married here at St Peter's Church in Baradon. Thomas was 24, Marianne 26. For the next eight years, they lived in this house in Adam and Eve Street. Their first child, John Mason Cook, was born here in January 1834. When Thomas first came to Market Harbour before his marriage, he joined the Coventry Road Baptist Church. The preaching of its minister, Francis Beardsall, against the dangers of drink, struck a chord with him, having worked for two alcoholic employers. As a result, in 1833, he signed the pledge to abstain from spirits. Three years later, he extended the pledge to include all forms of alcohol after hearing an abstinent lecture here in Market Harbour at Town Hall. In fact, it made such an impression on him that next day he and six others formed the South Midland Temperance Association. Thomas worked tirelessly as secretary, arranging meetings, attending conferences and organising social events. But he met with violent opposition from brewers and publicans who hired thugs to attack temperance workers and damage their homes. Thomas was booed, hissed and sneered at in the streets and stones were thrown at him. He had vivid memories of the time. My house in Adam and Eve Street was violently assailed and bricks came flying through the window to the imminent danger of Mrs Cook and myself. On one occasion, a horse's leg bone was thrown at me with such violence that, striking me at the back of the neck, I was felled to the ground. Ugly opposition made Thomas more determined than ever to find alternative forms of recreation to drink to reduce the social misery it caused. On the 9th of June, 1841, he walked the 15 miles from Market Harbour to Leicester to attend a temperance meeting. 
as he was passing the Congregational Chapel here in Kibworth Harcourt, an idea occurred to him right out of the blue. He recalled the moment. About midway between Harborough and Leicester, my mind's eye has often reverted to that spot. A thought flashed through my brain. What a glorious thing it would be if the newly developed powers of railways and locomotion could be made subservient to the promotion of temperance. By the time he'd reached the venue, the idea was fully formed in his mind. He told the gathering he wanted to turn their next meeting in Loughborough into a special event on a non-profit basis. He would invite the public to a fun day out in Loughborough at a price everyone could afford. On the 5th of July, 1841, 570 passengers assembled at Leicester's Campbell Street station to begin Thomas Cook's first ever railway excursion. Never before had such a large number travelled by train. The local press reported that between 2,000 and 3,000 spectators turned up at the station eager to witness this extraordinary event. Despite all the excitement, some passengers were very nervous at travelling by rail for the first time, and they had good reason. Nine of the ten carriages had no roofs and no seats, and accommodated as many people as could be squeezed in. Furthermore, there was no protection from smoke, soot or sparks. Thomas felt it essential, therefore, to escort the party personally to give them reassurance. This became a feature of all his pioneering excursions. The train's arrival at Loughborough Station met with unbelievable excitement and the pioneering excursionists were welcomed by over 2,000 people. They were led by a brass band to this park on the estate of a keen temperance supporter, William Paget. Thomas had organised a gala in the park, not just for the 570 excursionists, but also for some 2,500 more people who wanted to take part in the festivities. At tea time, a substantial picnic was laid on for everyone. From 6 to 9 p.m., the crowd listened to a series of rousing speeches about the dangers of drink. Now that's not the sort of way we would finish up an afternoon of fun and games today, but at that time, stirring public speakers were an exciting source of entertainment. The day was a huge success and attracted national interest. Thomas always looked back on it as the start of his career in tourism. With more excursions in mind, Thomas felt Leicester would be an ideal base because of its good rail connections. He also felt he could make a better living here as a printer and publisher. And so, two months after the successful Loughborough trip, he moved to Leicester with Marianne and John. He later built a temperance hotel in Granby Street. It served as the family home and also as the hub of all of his business activities. He even ran a soup kitchen from here. Next door, he built a temperance hall offering wholesome recreation and entertainment. Unfortunately, Thomas's printing business struggled. Although he was organizing cheap excursions to temperance events, he did so on a non-profit basis, so there was no income from them. After the birth of his daughter Annie in June 1845, with another mouth to feed, money became a matter of great concern. But where could he find it? He had an idea. Why not build on his reputation as a travel organiser and try commercial tourism. 
surely he could do this without compromising his ideals of affordable travel for all. He decided to go ahead. Thomas's first commercial expedition was from Leicester to Liverpool, the gateway to the New World, and then on by steamer to Carnarvon and the ascent of Snowdon. Planning the trip to Liverpool was not straightforward because the train from Leicester ran across the lines of four different railway companies, each issuing an individual ticket. Thomas persuaded them to issue a single ticket valid across all lines and at an affordable price. He then produced the handbook of the trip to Liverpool, which contained the full itinerary plus information about the sites to be visited. Demand for the 350 tickets was so great that they were bought and resold on the black market at exorbitant prices. The world's first tourist excursion arrived at Liverpool's Lime Street station on the 4th of August, 1845, escorted by Thomas. The party was armed with his handbook, ready to explore the sights of Liverpool. It was the world's first tourist guidebook. After visiting Liverpool, the party continued by steamer here to Carnarvon. Their arrival at the quayside caused huge excitement. It was the biggest crowd of tourists this Welsh-speaking town had ever seen. But fortunately, someone was found who spoke enough English to act as a guide for them. This magnificent castle couldn't fail to impress the visitors. it was on to Snowdon and Thomas led the party to the top. Today there's a much easier way of getting there and we're on the Snowdon Mountain Railway. Well, we're at the top of Snowdon but we can't see very much because the mist has enveloped us. Thomas had a much better experience. He could see from the top a clear sunny day. For him, the whole trip was such a success that he repeated it two weeks later with a party of 800, and he realized he'd found a winning formula on which to build. He wrote in his diary, from the heights of Snowdon, my thoughts took flight to Loch Lomond, and I determined to try to get to Scotland. With Scotland now firmly in his sights, Thomas planned a tour which would include Glasgow, where we are now, Edinburgh, and of course, Loch Lomond. Because there were no rail links to Scotland at the time, it would mean taking a steamer from Fleetwood in Lancashire to Ardrossan on the west coast of Scotland, and then on from there here to Glasgow. Thomas had planned a series of stops on the route from Leicester where his party of 500 had set off on the 25th of June, 1846. He'd planned these stops for refreshments and toilet breaks, but the train didn't stop. Next, there were problems with the steamer. There were too few cabins, much fewer than expected, and the result was that many passengers, including Thomas, had to spend the wet, windy night on the open deck. Thankfully, the rest of the trip was a great success. In fact, it was considered such an achievement to organize a tour for 500 people that when the train pulled into Glasgow's Bridge Street station, guns were fired in salute. The party was then led here to the City Hall for a reception. 
It's difficult for us today to imagine why large-scale tourism could cause such a sensation. Perhaps a modern equivalent might be the possibility of space tourism in the near future. After visiting Glasgow, the next stop was here to Edinburgh to see the sights. Again, as in Glasgow, the party's arrival caused a sensation because a group of this size had never been seen here before. They were given a rousing reception by a brass band at the station. In honour of these pioneering excursionists, a special musical event was arranged for them in the evening. From Edinburgh, the tour took in other attractive locations. One was of special significance to Thomas, Loch Lomond. His vision on the summit of Snowdon had now been realized. Things seemed to be working out really well for Thomas as a tour operator, but then he was landed a devastating blow. Despite the success of the greater part of the tour, some of the excursionists took legal action against Thomas because of the inconveniences they'd suffered on the journey to Fleetwood and on the steamer. The cost of these lawsuits plunged him deeply into debt. He only narrowly avoided bankruptcy. It was a distressing experience, but Thomas pressed on regardless with more visits to Scotland. In the autumn, of 1847, in an astute marketing move, he organized a tour following the route that Queen Victoria and Prince Albert had recently taken to the Highlands and the Hebridean Islands of Staffa and Iona. When the party arrived on Iona, Thomas was dismayed to see the extreme poverty of the inhabitants and resolved to help them. He raised enough money to buy 24 fishing boats to enable them to make a living. It gave him great joy to do this, and he later recalled, there is a pleasure in these pursuits which selfishness can never appreciate. Just as Thomas's finances were beginning to recover, the railway companies pulled the plug on him. They decided to organize excursions themselves and cut him out as middleman to maximize their profits. But this didn't stop Thomas. Ever resourceful, he decided to organize trips to places of local interest within striking distance of Leicester using horse-drawn coaches. The first was in August 1848 to the gardens of Melbourne Hall. Most of Melbourne's 3,000 inhabitants turned out to see the unusual spectacle of a brass band leading a procession of coaches carrying over a hundred visitors through their village. The next trip was to Beaver Castle, the home of the Duke of Rutland. Along the 28-mile route from Leicester, such was the excitement that the coaches were greeted by music at each village they passed through. Thomas found a ready market for his coach trips, but an unexpected change of heart by the railway companies allowed him to switch back to rail travel. They just couldn't manage without him. With the railways once again at his disposal, Thomas resumed his Scottish tours. In 1849, he brought two parties here, totaling about a 1,000 people, and it was the start of a regular programme of visits. He brought up to 5,000 a season. He also organised tours to North Wales, the Isle of Man and Ireland. By 1850, he had escorted 15,000 people some 7,500 miles and was able to add the words excursion agent to his advertised list of business activities. Enthused about the progress he'd made, he wrote, 
by the end of the season of 1850, I'd become so thoroughly imbued with the tourist spirit that I began to contemplate foreign trips, including the continent of Europe, the United States, and the eastern lands of the Bible. Intending to make America his first foreign destination, Thomas set off to Liverpool to explore the possibilities of transatlantic tourist travel. On the way, he stopped in Derby and happened to meet two directors of the Midland Railway. They told him that Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, was organising the first international trade fair in the world to give Britain and the rest of the world the opportunity to showcase their manufacturing achievements in a spirit of friendship and peace. One of them, Joseph Paxton, had been commissioned to design the biggest glass structure in the world to house the exhibits. Thomas applauded the idea and the spirit behind it, as a central aim of all his excursions was to bring man nearer to man, he promptly agreed to their request to suspend his American plans and organise excursions to the fair instead. The fair was opened on the 1st of May, 1851, by Queen Victoria. Paxton's colossal glass structure became known as the Crystal Palace. The entrance was here on this site. During the exhibition months from May to October, Thomas transported 165,000 excursionists from the Midlands. Many were low-paid manual workers for whom he'd arranged specially cheap fares, even though it meant a drastic reduction in his own profits. His careful planning and thorough organisation earned him a national reputation as a travel organiser. Three years later, after more successful excursions, Thomas decided to give up his printing business and concentrate solely on tourist travel. By July 1855, he felt ready to cross the English Channel for the first time, taking a party of 25 to Brussels and Paris and continuing with them on a Rhine cruise from Cologne to Strasbourg. The tour also inspired an appreciation of the beauties of nature. One young woman wrote in her diary, the glorious sights that have filled my mind with such ideas of natural beauty have also in some degree purified and refined my thoughts and given me higher concepts of the creator. This would have delighted Thomas who said that one of his stated aims was to give his tourists the opportunity to behold the handiwork of the Great Supreme and thus bring people closer to God. Thomas's excursions abroad were a huge success, but the staple of his business remained his Scottish tours. By 1860, he brought some 50,000 people here, but two years later, the Scottish railway companies pulled the plug on him. They again replaced him with their own personnel in order to increase profits. Without Scotland, Thomas's business couldn't survive, and so he looked to Switzerland as an alternative source of revenue. His first Swiss tour set off in June 1863 for Geneva, stopping at Paris on the way to see the sights. From Geneva, the party was transported to Chamonix, Interlaken and Lucerne. It was such a success that it was repeated several times that year. By the summer of 1864, the Scottish railway companies realised they couldn't manage without Thomas's expertise and invited him back but he declined because his European tours were taking up all his time. In fact, they were so successful, he organised his first tour to Italy in 1864, visiting Rome, Naples, 
Pompeii and Vesuvius. It was such a success, it was very quickly repeated. His business was now financially very strong and continued to grow rapidly. Despite his financial success, Thomas never lost sight of his ideals. He saw his tours as, quote, a mission of goodwill and universal brotherhood. By making travel affordable to all, Thomas was accused by many of attracting tourists described as low-bred and stupid, who couldn't possibly appreciate the wonders of nature or the glories of art and architecture. In fact, his tourists were impeccably well-behaved and appreciative of all they saw, but still they were scathingly dismissed as Cook's Hordes, Cook's Circus, or simply as a mob. Thomas was infuriated by this arrogant attitude. He resisted those who wanted, he said, to reserve statue and mountain, painting and lake, historical association and natural beauty for the so-called upper classes. He made his own position perfectly clear. I see no sin in introducing natural and artistic wonders to all. God's earth, with all its fullness and beauty, is for the people. No amount of criticism could hold Thomas back. Having opened up Europe, he decided to explore the potential of North America as a tourist destination. And so, in November 1865, he set sail from Liverpool for New York. He spent 11 weeks traveling 4,000 miles by rail. He took in the spectacular Niagara Falls, the cities of Washington DC, Chicago and Montreal, and he visited the home of Abraham Lincoln in Springfield, Illinois. The following spring, his son John followed exactly the same route. It was the start of North America as a popular tourist destination. As a devout Christian, Thomas had always felt drawn to visit places immortalized in the Bible. In 1869, with a party of 32, he set out for a 15-week tour of the Middle East. Starting in Egypt, the party visited the Sphinx, the Pyramids, and the Valley of the Kings. Their next destination was the Holy Land. Traveling across hot, dusty terrain, eight hours a day on horseback, it was an arduous journey. But it was greatly enjoyed by the tourists, who visited famous places such as Bethlehem and Jerusalem. For Thomas, it was more than a trip. It was a pilgrimage. He described it as the greatest event of my tourist life. Inspired by the success of this first tour, Thomas organized more. He was delighted that they inspired renewed interest in the Bible. Soon they attracted leading members of European royalty, including the future King of England. The mockers who had dismissed Cook's tourists as low-bred were finally silenced. Thomas's next great challenge was to circle the globe. In 1872, now aged 63, he set sail from Liverpool with nine companions for New York. The party crossed America to San Francisco and sailed across the Pacific to visit Japan and China before going on to India. They then came home to England via the Suez Canal. Such was the interest in the expedition that the Times newspaper of London invited Thomas to send regular reports for publication. He also sent reports of missionary work to two Baptist newspapers, knowing, he said, they would be appreciated by many who laudably contribute to the support of missionary operations and who labor and pray for the conversion of the world to Christ. Thomas himself took every opportunity to share his faith. He gave a sermon at a Baptist chapel in Chicago and a talk to Sunday school children and their teacher in Benares, India. This first round the world trip so excited the public's imagination that it became an annual event.
The same year Thomas completed his global tour, 1873, the company opened new purpose-built headquarters in this building in Ludgate Circus, London. Thomas's son John, an astute and dynamic businessman, ran operations here. He'd been made a full partner in the company the previous year when its name was changed to Thomas Cook and Son. Unfortunately, Thomas and John had conflicting values. John, who was profit-driven, felt strongly that his father didn't treat business seriously enough, always giving priority to his religious and philanthropic activities. It particularly annoyed him that Thomas spent so much time and money supporting Christian missions abroad. He also was troubled by the fact that Thomas, now 70, was clearly looking towards retirement. When the partnership agreement expired in 1878, John was reluctant to renew it. And so it was dissolved at the beginning of 1879 by mutual consent, and John took full control of the company. Whatever their disagreements, John recognized that his father's vision and pioneering spirit had created the foundations on which the success of the company had been built and graciously wrote to him, as long as you live, I want you to have half the profits of this business. With no further involvement in the company, Thomas moved into his retirement home with Marianne and Annie. His retirement was soon marred by tragedy. Sadly, in November 1880, Annie drowned in her bath here after being suffocated by fumes from a gas water heater. Thomas and Marianne were devastated. In fact, Marianne never recovered from this shock and her own health gradually declined until she died four years later, aged 77. In 1891, Thomas erected this mission hall and this block of cottages for the poor in memory of his beloved wife and daughter. They'd supported him in all his business activities and accompanied him on many of his excursions abroad. Loneliness was a heavy cross for Thomas to bear, but he found strength in his faith and remained positive and active. Even after turning 80, when he became increasingly frail and blind, he continued to attend temperance meetings and even visited the Holy Land. But eventually, his frailty caught up with him. At about 8 p.m. on the 18th of July, 1892, he suddenly felt unwell. He was having a stroke. Three hours later, he was dead. What is Thomas Cook's legacy? In a tribute to him, Prime Minister William Gladstone said, whole classes have for the first time found easy access to foreign countries and have acquired some of that familiarity with them, which breeds not contempt, but kindness. It would have given Thomas great joy to know that he'd helped foster goodwill between people of different nationalities. And it would have given him equal joy to know that in pursuing his aim of bringing man nearer to man and nearer to his creator, he had enriched the lives of countless millions. He is deservedly called the father of tourism. Thank you.